So good morning and welcome to Stone. I'm not sure just exactly how Heather's going to start, but I'm going to start anyway, and I'm going to ask Patty to come forward. <laughs> First step, am I? First step. Stand up here with me, please. Can you keep me company? <laughs> so, I wrote it down. <laughs> We've been so fortunate to have your spiritual guidance during your most sabbatical. Lessons you have taught, sharing your experiences and journeys. Both congregations have benefited from your thought-provoking sermons and your gentle nature. Thank you for all the time and effort dedicated to us. Know that God speaks through you and loves you, and may you be strengthened by that knowledge. Now, having just been in Clifford and hearing how disappointing is the congregation not to know what you receive, maybe you'd like to open that. <laughs> they have a story about making a beautiful wall painting for a minister who never showed it to anybody. <laughs> track of all my school here this year. <laughs> I'm fired, I'm going to turn the mic over to you. It's really surprising how quickly this time has gone, and I want to welcome Heather back. Lisa did a wonderful job. We're still happy to have you back. <laughs> And we hope that you have had a wonderful rest, a time of reflection, a time of re-energizing spiritually, and uh, the flowers there are for you as a welcome back gift. And I was looking at our gardens, which I have some pictures to share with you today, and uh, they could use some. Oh, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you. We hope you are rested, refreshed, and rejuvenated. Robbie's don't pass us out. It seemed uh, fitting to start with the call to worship this morning um, in Bryant, with Brian, and uh, then we'll move into our announcements. On the seventh day, God rested and celebrated all of creation. God surveyed all that God made and said, It is good. It is a good to gather each Sunday to be the church and celebrate God's presence in our lives. Heather, this morning we welcome you back to our shared ministry. We give thanks for your safe return from your sabbatical, and we look forward to you sharing the gifts you received from the Holy One during your time away. In the time away from my usual responsibilities, you invited me to discover a childlike curiosity and enjoy a thorough refreshment of body, mind, and spirit. You asked God to grant me times of reading, play, deep contemplation, rich conversation, leisurely dreaming, and focused reflection, and that I might gaze in wonder at the beauty of creation and draw fresh water at the well of loving relationship. I was able to do this and more, and for this I thank you and I thank God. Just we trusted that God would be at work in your life in this side of time. God was in the lives of the people of our churches, using all things for our good and the strength and the renewal of our communal life and faith. With you, I'm grateful to Lisa and our worship committees for their leadership in worship. To Reverend John Bennett for his support as your pastor to our supervisor. To everyone who offered care through prayers, kind words, visits, and notes. Lisa's work as our secretary, the leadership of our sabbatical committee, Barb and Brian, and all those who took on additional responsibilities while I was away. In the coming days, I pray our learning and reflections will help us deepen our relationship with God and each other and open us to new ways of being the church so that others might find welcome and faith in our congregations. Amen. Amen. 
grace and peace to you from our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And also to you. So, uh, we'll go to the ads. And, uh, I like to scoop the master. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Okay. Oh, I'm just oh, you, I'm here I got you. Right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we, uh, there is a note on the door at Rockwood, so I hope if folks didn't catch the change that uh, they will join us for lunch. Um, I had this thought that we would take you all to St. Jacob's this morning, and it's a long way. <laughs> so we're going to bring you some pictures, and I hope someday that you'll have a chance to, to come and see our new home. And uh, But we brought lunch to you, so John's that got soups on, there's uh, pumpkin soup and potato and um, sausage soup, and there's cold meats and cheese and veggies, and, and I had time to make some scones this morning. So I hope that uh, you will stay and enjoy with us. Um, it is it is good to be back, and it seemed good to share a meal together. So so thank you to the Rockwood folk for coming over this morning, and to Stone for hosting. Um, we are moving into the fall, and I'm so grateful to the folks that uh, did the congregation packs. Your reflections were amazing, and I know they will be appreciated. There are two blank ones, so if you know somebody that would like one. Um, in your neighborhood, you're welcome to pick one up, and there are a couple of the extra piece box wraps. So if you like them, um, feel free to, to help yourself. They're on the table at the back. Um, it is Thanksgiving, and so the food bank is in need, and uh, Marcia and Kay have done the, the legwork to find out what we need. Um, so children's snacks, pasta sauce, no dry pasta, um, peanut butter, canned soups, canned pasta, condiments like cast ketchup, mustard, relish, and mayo, shampoo and conditioner. Um, they always need milk and eggs, so those could be left in, in the fridges in the church that Marcia know, um, or drop things off at her house, the non-perfect things outside, I presume. And, or, or always, um, if you would rather donate funds, um, they can be payable to Rockwood United, and then the opportunity is able to buy the best bargains. Um, so there's a, there's a big need in our community, and if you can help with that, um, it's been nice to be able to start it ahead of Thanksgiving instead of, you know, so that people are receiving in that time. Did I get it all? <laughs> yes, thank you. So thank you for, for doing that. Um, we have book club this week. It's at 7.30 on Wednesday and uh, either here at Stone or on Zoom. And we're uh, looking at The Silver Swan by Benjamin Black. It's Brian's book, so it will be... Um, you want to say something about it? It's a deep mystery. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's an intriguing mystery. <laughs> um, so be interesting conversation, I'm sure. Uh, there is choir Thursday at 7 here at Stone and at Rockland, and I know new voices are always uh, appreciated. Uh, next Sunday, we, we will worship at our regular times, uh, 9.45 here and 11.15 at Rockland. And Wednesday, September 25th, is Stone's uh, takeout uh, turkey dinner. So uh, get in touch with Edie and, and book your spaces. How are we doing on that, Edie? 71 days. 71. And you can go to about 90. We'd like to have Edie be good to be good to So, uh, yeah, so get in touch with Edie. That's awesome. Uh, and our uh, men are having coffee at the Bearded Barista at the end of the month, September 26th at 10.30, and uh, September 28th is breakfast at Rockwood, so we're back into the swing of things. Uh, September 29th, we'll do our shirt Sunday, and uh, Lisa is going to send out today a, a letter from Stephen Jackson um, about what's happening at Ishmael Outreach, and uh, they have an online gathering coming up on the 24th that you'll want to have a look at, see if you'd like to be a part of that. He's talking about reconciliation. So uh, those are the announcements that I have. Other announcements this morning. Brian's here so that you can speak into the microphone. <laughs> Any other announcements, things I've missed? Good news to share, things that you're excited about.
Yeah, I just want to mention uh, this one. Yeah, I, I just uh, I just want to mention that uh, I, I recently spent uh, ten days on a bike boat trip in, uh, along the Danube and uh, uh, had great weather uh, and uh, a little bit better, actually a little bit better weather than they're having in Europe right now. So, uh, it very enjoyable. Wonderful. Glad for a safe travel. I think are good news to share. I'm going to share some good news for my sister who's not here. Her good news is that she's not here. Uh, she was at Las Vegas with her friends this week, so I picked her up at the airport at 7.15. And I was a little bit uh, traumatized from my last fly experience. I'm like, I'm probably going to have to make, come to church. There's no way we can make it home in time for me to go to church. But her flight was on time and everything went smoothly, so I had to take her home before coming here. <laughs> I just want to thank everybody for listening to us for many months talking about moving in with our boys and I highly recommend never move again because uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's been four months of uh, entertaining times and I feel really blessed that we can help the boys and help Alan and uh, it's been good so uh, I hope everybody can come to our house and come to visit because uh, we really enjoy being there. of distortion. Well, uh, at least I'll try and work on that for you also. Sorry, I hope it improves. Um, so I would ask you to keep um, Georgina Ferguson's family in your thoughts and prayers. And she died on uh, Tuesday at 10 a.m. and uh, her family is going to celebrate her life this coming Tuesday at Walt Preston's at 11 and there will be visitation before. Would like to, to see her boundaries. We light our candle for the good news we've shared, the good news in our hearts, and the good news that whatever's happening in our own lives can be with us. Oh, I forgot where the face is. The cards are going to be on the project. Have a birthday bar? Anybody else? Bill? I did celebrate the birthday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a nice place to celebrate. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I'm sorry, I wasn't sure. Uh, let's say happy birthday first. I want to thank you. And, and it's just normal, right? I've got things mixed up already. So we're all happy to do that. So Mark and Bill, any other birthdays? Oh, yeah. Yes, oh, Jean Jackson, 99 today. So okay. Bill and Mark and Jean. <laughs> Let's 
continue our worship with our Mandarin music. Yeah, thank you. 
and speak to God. I'd like to read uh, Mark 8, 27 to 38 to you this morning. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? They answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by all the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and he said to them, If any will wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, they, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the Holy Angels. May God bless this reading to our understanding and our faithful living. Amen. That's the backyard. And you will see where uh, Helen puts the mummies because that's her handiwork. So, um, please join in singing over to <laughs> of our minds and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable 
in your sight, O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. So this picture, uh, the one that follows, are taken at Banyas in Israel uh, when I was there in 1997. So it gives you a sense of where our gospel story took place. Uh, Caesarea Philippi was the Roman's name for this place uh, that had been a holy place for millennia. The god of Pan, the god of Baal, many gods were worshipped in this place and then the, the um, Romans believed that Caesar was the god so they renamed her in his honor. According to Mark's gospel, Jesus had been teaching and healing for three years. He had started to disturb the religious leaders. He and his disciples were here in Caesarea Philippi. This, uh, the spring that comes out of Mount Hermon in this place is part of the beginnings of the Jordan River. So it's a, it's a holy place, a place that's important to the earth and was important for the, the Romans to claim as their own. Though the disciples didn't know it, they were at a turning point. They were about to turn south. They're in the north of Galilee, and they're going to turn south uh, towards Judea and Jerusalem. Jesus was turning towards the cross, and he had much to teach the disciples on the way. He needed to start where they were. He needed to be able to build on what they'd already learned. So he started by asking them, who do people say that I am? Who do they think I am? And they said, well, some of them um, think that you're John the Baptist reincarnated. It was well known that Herod Antipas, uh, who had John the Baptist killed for his wife Herodias, uh, believed that Jesus was John the Baptist coming back to haunt him. And, and so that, that was in, uh, people were talking about that. Other people were knew that before the Messiah could come, Elijah needed to come back. The Messiah, or the Christ in Greek, uh, would only come after a time of chaos and after a time when Elijah had come back and went in with people. So some people called John the Baptist Elijah. Other people were now saying, no, Jesus must be Elijah. But they recognized that he spoke from God, so they definitely said that he must be a prophet. So Elijah... John the Baptist, a prophet, they recognized him as someone holy. Nobody was quite ready to say that he was the one that they had been waiting for, the Messiah, the one that they thought that was going to come and restore the kingdom of David, the one that was going to chase out the Romans and put Israel back in the place that it was meant to be by God. Then Jesus said to them, who do you say that I am? Peter said, the Messiah. He knew. They had been with Jesus. They had journeyed with him. They had watched him heal and teach. And Peter could say with assurance that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus says, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. We trust that Jesus truly was the Messiah, but he didn't want it spread around because people had been so conditioned to this way of thinking that the Messiah was a warrior that would ride in on a horse and bring armies. And he needed them to reframe that, to relearn what it meant to be God's Messiah. And so they weren't to tell anybody right now. That time would come after what was to happen. Then he started to tell them that he would have to suffer at the hands of the scribes and, and the leaders, and he would have to die on the cross, and then he would rise again. Peter couldn't hear this. No way. That's not happening, Jesus. It can't be. He took Jesus aside to tell him, you've got to stop saying this. And Jesus turned so that all the disciples could hear and say, Get behind me, Satan. You're not thinking of God's things. You're thinking of human things. He wasn't calling Peter Satan. He was saying that in the words that you're offering me, my good friend and follower, you're tempting me to turn my back on what God wants. 
I need you not to be that voice of temptation. I need you to be with me. I need you to understand what I'm going to face. As followers of Jesus, we're urged to make the same commitment to him that he made to God. We are meant to commit our lives to loving God with all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. I spent some time reflecting on, am I doing that? Am I living my life in a way that puts God first before everything else? Jesus assures us that no matter the trials that we will face, if we follow him, our lives will be richer and fuller and what God meant truly for us to live. When I started thinking about my sabbatical a year and a half ago, uh, whatever we needed to let uh, Western Ontario Waterways know that it was going to happen, I, I had things in mind. I was going to start off, I timed it just so I could start off with the Festival of Homiletics. And I wasn't going to Western Ontario Waterways this year, so, so I could really focus on the festival and I could really enjoy it. It's online, I'd be at home, you know, my house would be in order, the, the condo in Guelph, you know, that place. Um, and, and John and I, uh, for the, that would be the middle of May, the first of June, we were going on a cruise to Alaska. He's always wanted to go on a cruise and I have heard that that's a wonderful one, so we, we had that booked. Um, I was going to sew. I have so much cloth. Some of it you uh, received in uh, beeswax wraps. Um, and I was going to work on my computer files, and that meant that the church computer files would get sorted out too, because I've got a plan now, and that was all going to happen. Um, I was going to read, and I was going to take better care of my body. And then at the end of the summer, we had it open. Three, four weeks, maybe more, and Goose Bay was great. Um, Goose Bay was so wonderful last year. I was really excited about that. Great plan. What is it? Make a plan, la bas? I think that's how it works. Uh, and then uh, the end of January, you know, the last couple of days of January, Helen said, Mom, Dad, I think we should move in together. It would be really nice to live together. And before we could turn around, she was contacting realtors. So we said, no, we need to get ahead of this. And uh, so John contacted a friend. And he came in on Friday. And Helen called and said, there's a house in Waterloo. we got to go see the house in Waterloo. And uh, so we, um, we went on Saturday with the realtor. We saw the house in Waterloo. We packed all five of us into my Prius. And we went on to Elmira and Heidelberg. And we, we saw three houses that day. And one sign, we, everybody was almost in the door before we realized the open house was Sunday, not Saturday. And, and uh, Sunday, uh, before we got home from church, Helen was calling and said, you got to go to that open house. you got to check it out. Well, by Tuesday, we'd all been there, and little John was saying, Mom, Grandma, Papa, Aunt Lisa, you all have to put in an offer on this so we make sure we get the house. Um, it, it was a done deal. We, uh, the offer was in, but of course, Things don't work out the way you planned. Another condo in our building sold that weekend as we were about to put ours online. It hadn't been up for sale for any length of time at all. And so this was great, except it wasn't. I think that was the one that needed to sell. And, and then we were waiting, and we were wondering, and, and we, were, we had to do more open houses than we could ever imagine. And so we sent Sarah away. She had to live with Helen. Uh, we'd get up on Saturday and Sunday mornings, and one would vacuum, and one would dust, and one would tidy. And, and then we'd go out the door either uh, for church or, or for the day, wherever we could be. And, and still, no offers, no interest. And we were getting more and more anxious. And, and then in the end, uh, we did the drop the price, do the bidding more thing. The folks in St. Jacobs even dropped their price because they were so anxious that we would get the house. And uh, uh, we got two offers. And Lisa had been bugging me, Mom, if you would just take that picture of Jesus down from the living room, I think we'd be better off. <laughs> she, you've seen it before. She thinks it's really creepy. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then there's her Harry Potter stuff upstairs, you know. So I mean, uh, so we had two offers: one from the lady that loved that it was a Christian home and would have loved to own it, and one from the young girls and their mom, who 
who had tried on the Harry Potter sorting hat, we're pretty <laughs> sure, and we're delighted that it was a Harry Potter house. And, uh, and it was the mom and her two girls who bought the house. Needless to say, my summer didn't turn out the way I planned. I finally started listening to my recordings of the Festival of Homiletics this week, only to discover I don't get to see the people. They're only audio recordings at this point. Um, but I still have those to look forward to. We canceled our cruise. I couldn't imagine um, going on the 1st of June. Um, Rick talked to us over the summer, and he finally said, Heather, are you coming? to see me or are you coming for you? And I said, the jury's out on that, I'm not sure. And he said, well, don't come to see me, I'm gonna come see you. So he's coming this week uh, to spend 11 days with us and we didn't make it to Happy Valley Goose Bay. That, that'll be another time. I spent most of the summer organizing our new home, I'm keeping up with our grandsons and my niece and nephew. Uh, I'm now the contact for Max and Emma at school. I've been to both schools to pick them up, uh, driven Max to his one of his early uh, shifts as a lifeguard that he started this fall. Um, it, we've been doing things. John, little John, frequently says, Grandma, come play basketball with me. It's called winter ball. The winner gets the ball every time, so Grandma can get it away, but by the time I get to back, I double dribble, then he gets it back. Um, so he wins 50 to nothing every time, I put a limit at 50, that's all I can watch. Um, but, but we have a wonderful time, we find, the, we find the boys curled up in different rooms, we thought they'd be in the basement with the pool table, the ping pong table, well, William's taken Papa's chair, that's his spot. He can hide out there for hours with his phone and nobody notices him because everybody else wants so much attention. Um, John curls up upstairs. If he's not wrestling Jay, Jay is a set of coveralls with a face that we put 20 pounds of cloth in and he wrestles it and drops it on the floor and she hear that down two floors <laughs> as it hits the floor. Um, and uh, Henry, he. He will go wherever the people are that he wants to be with. So you can find them curled up in my office. You'll find them upstairs in the craft room. Uh, lots of different places. We, um, I, I did listen to books. I think I counted 60 books that I either read or listened to. And uh, my spiritual director had said, you know what our book club did? We decided to pick old favorites, and mine was Heidi. And I discovered if you have an Audible subscription, they have 8,000 free books, and a lot of them are those old classics. And so I listened to Swiss Family Robinson and The Three Musketeers and, and all kinds of, of books and, and lots of others too. And then some, some reflecting. Those, those books have as much to offer for reflection on our lives and the way we see the world as some of the theology like Dietrich Bonhoeffer that I was reading this week. We, uh, we have spent time in the uh, gardens. Uh, Helen and John have been planting over each other. One puts in um, one thing and then the other puts something else in on top. So we have blueberries and rhubarb and tomatoes that we're all fighting for the same spots. But it's starting to sort itself out and, and uh, Helen definitely has the green thumb in the family. I did do a little bit for uh, Rockwood and Stone. I definitely was praying for our trustees. God bless them um, at Rockwood as they struggled with the non-sale of the parking lot again. But I heard that there's $40,000 in the bank from the deposit. So that was uh, indeed a gift um, after such a long wait and such a disappointment. Um, I also got a note that our insurance would be canceled if it wasn't paid by Friday and discovered that Amanda was off and called and said, I will pay it. I don't want to come back to this in September. I didn't need to. We got it sorted out. But uh, there were there were a couple of things that seemed worthy of my attention. The other thing that I did was I completed an anti-racism foundation certificate at the University of Western Ontario. I had started it uh, back earlier in the year, and and I went back and finished it um, because. None of these things really were the things I planned. I started, the closer we got to September, the grumpier I got. Everything everybody did was making me mad and I couldn't figure out why until I realized it was because I didn't know what I was gonna tell you. I, I didn't know what I had done 
that was going to be of any kind of gift to you um, in the summer. But I had spent time with uh, my acupuncturist, Bing, and she has taught me to go for a walk. Um, so most days I go for a walk, so I think I come to you in better health. Um, I went to worship a number of times, not every week, but I worshipped in St. Jacob's. I tried to worship at the United Church in um, Florida, hence the sign on the note door at Rockwood today. Um, but luckily the Mennonites were worshipping even though the United Church wasn't, so we joined them. And, and uh, then I joined uh, Hartminster and Waterloo and, and Westminster when all the Westminster, all the four churches were gathered together from Waterloo to worship for the summer. And in each place, there was gift, um, the messages, the people, and there were things that I went, oh, that doesn't feel like home. That's not the way I like to sing. Um, yeah. But one place, Parkminster, felt like going home. And uh, we were there with my brother's uh, best friend's parents and chance to catch up with them. In those experiences, I was able to ask myself, what is special about us? What is unique? And, and what if somebody comes to visit, do we need to explain it to them? Because it's different when you come in for the first time. We might be used to something, but for somebody else, it might feel a little uncomfortable. Um, so a chance to do that kind of reflection. All around me, in um, gatherings with other clergy and, and friends, I was hearing things like the church is getting older and smaller, Minister's times are being reducing. That time, church is going down to half time. That church is going down to three quarter time. Uh, one retired minister, when we were at the four churches gathered, said, "Now this is the right size congregation. They should close three of them and all worship together." But that's easy for you to say. Not so easy if, if you're the congregations. At the same time, that we're hearing these voices. I started hearing different voices. We uh, went to my aunt and uncle's twice in the summer, both for family gatherings, and both times their church family was there. And each time they would count off for everybody, we have four ministers here today, we have five ministers here today. And so realizing how important it is to them to have their church connection and, and what that community means to them and what ministers mean to them, especially if once they're niece, I guess. Um, but the other, uh, the other part about that being there was my cousin, who, when she was 15, was one of the youngest people ever baptized in her Mennonite church. She and her sister were so passionate about the church that they didn't wait until they were 18 or, or whatever the normal age was. And then her life took her on a different path, and she um, now has a very um, important job at Grand River Hospital. She got that by working long hours as a physiotherapist and working weekends and, and she had three children to raise and her time with the church just didn't work out. When they asked to, um, for a behavior plan for her son, that was it, she was out. She didn't need that in her life. But now she's looking at her three young adult children and watching people in the world and seeing young people that are connecting more online than they are in person and she said, I'm hearing they're lonely. I'm hearing they need people in their lives. They need places to connect. The church can do that. What are you doing about it? What is your church doing about it? The right answer would have been, you need to go back to your church and get started. Um, I didn't think she was ready for it. But, but it reminded me that the church has been so important to us. It's a place that we have connected with God and with each other, and other people don't know what we have here. So how do we faithfully share that? How do we faithfully follow Jesus and help people to understand what it means to have that relationship with the Holy One? That certificate program I did with the University of Western Ontario taught me that our church is on the right path because it doesn't matter what business or organization you go to, they're doing diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we, we've been doing that work all along. We've been doing the work reconnecting with our First Nations brothers and sisters, apologizing to a Japanese-Canadian um, 
brothers and sisters who were displaced during the war. Um, thinking about the Jewish uh, vote that wasn't received in World War II in Canada with open arms, but was sent on its way back to Europe. We've been doing this work. We understand that we need to reframe our way of looking at the world that the residential schools that I had to think about, I had to realize, I thought they were a good thing. I don't know about you, but when we were in school, I couldn't imagine how those families could live on the land and not be educated. And, you know, that that was a good thing to, to be in the modern world. I know those thoughts went through my head. And now we see that harm that was done, and we also see what was lost in the land and the association with the land. And we're working together to reclaim that. Our church is a part of that, of that changing in the world that is turning to love and inclusion and recognizing the diversity as gift. Um, and it, it just makes me understand that we have so much more to do and we are so capable. You, those of you that wrote Contemplation and Conversation this summer, they were wonderful, they were thought-provoking, and, and I know others of you can do that. Um, feel free to let me know. I'm happy to, to include other voices. Um, I think tomorrow night there's a gathering of uh, the clusters that we started, uh, and they're looking at a 100th anniversary gathering with Email, um, nope, wrong way. Um, Barry Hill and Speedside, Aaron, Arthur, Bellwood Metz, the churches that we had gathered here in the spring are working together. And God is with us. I'm thinking I didn't do anything, and then I'm looking back and going, oh, but that fits in with what we've been talking about. This is happening, and by the way, God hasn't forgotten me because Wednesday I came down to Guelph and I met with the Guelph ministers and we, we finished coffee about 5 to 10, caught up, and, and I had packets for Jack Gallen and Mark Cox in my hand, and I had Lisa's message that Georgina had gone into hospice on Tuesday evening, and I'm like, well, hospice should probably be there all day. I could do Jack and Mark both before lunch, but I think I'll go to hospice. And I walked into hospice, and I've only been a few times since the pandemic, so I was still getting oriented. And there was Brenda, who has been worshiping with us. And she said, oh, you're here, Heather brought you. And I said, well, Lisa told me, Heather's her sister-in-law. Um, Heather had emailed to say that Georgina was in hospice and then was to be in touch that she had died in the night. But the family was gathering to say goodbye. And so they were so grateful that I was there and we could talk together and then experience the amazing ritual that hospice has of walking out with the body as it's received by the funeral home. And uh, one of the staff sang, The Lord's My Shepherd, because it was Georgina's favorite. And I was able to offer a prayer because I was there. And Brenda said when they had done that for her dad, it had more meaning because they were right there than even the celebration of his life. And, and so what, a, what an amazing gift to be there at that time. I still uh, got back to um, the village of the Arboretum and I thought, well, I'll start with Mark because John will have a set time for lunch. John delivered his packet uh, later in the week. But there was Mark walking and, and I told you, Bing's got me, you've got to go out for a walk every day. And we were going to be driving Helen to the airport. There was going to be no walking. And I looked at Mark and I said, you're walking somewhere. She said, I'm going to the post office, or the mailbox. Can I walk with you? Sure. And so we walked down and around to the mailbox, had a wonderful visit, sat back in her beautiful home and, and talked. And um, when she and Gord first bought their little four-room house with two stoves that had to both run in the winter, one wood, one uh, oil, um, they lived right beside the Fletchers, which was Georgina's family. And so there were neighbors, and across the road was Marie Milne. And uh, so glad to hear about those connections and know that, that those ladies are in their 90s, 80s, 90s. And the church has been a part of their lives. Those of you who continue to visit and connect with them have been a part of their lives, their whole life. Being the church matters. Like the disciples, 
we had particular ways of being the church in the past, but life has changed. It's, it's turned to new directions, and we're getting used to new things, like conversation that's not so new anymore, and, and uh, not dressing up. I always love when somebody new comes in and they're all in a suit and tie, and they go, hmm. not, not the same anymore. But as we learn to be open to new things, we be open to the spirit who can invite others into our needs, can help other people find this place where we hear stories that invite us back to reconnect with God, to recommit our lives to God. This place where knowing the holy and being in relationship with each other helps lift us up. And that we can then share that message that we are all belong, beloved children of God, with those who join us. May it be so. I uh, suggested that we sing a couple of hymns and then I talk too long. Um, so you've got one open there, Liz. Uh, at the end. At the end. Um, does somebody have a favorite hymn that you'd like to? Let's sing a couple of verses of two or three hymns. I should have let you know earlier. While you're doing that, I invite you to think about where the Holy Spirit has been in your life this summer, and we'll share a few of those Holy Spirit moments. Is there a favorite hymn? I'm going to sing, I want to pull up. Okay. I feel like I should know the number of that one. But 574. 574? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Let's sing the first and last verses.
So, where have you experienced the Holy Spirit's guidance um, this summer? So, something that's happened that you were so grateful and just felt like a gift from God. While, while you're thinking, I, I can say that one day we were heading to Bingham's and as per usual, it took five times longer than it normally should. And as we were walking out the door, a red car pulled up and I went, oh my goodness, that's the lady from Arthur. We uh, talked to Arthur and they are using bulletins still. And we said, well, we have all these bulletins. We received a wonderful gift of paper from Barry Hill and Speedside that we're still using. So we passed our bulletins on and there she was to pick them up at St. Jacob's. And it was, oh, God took care of us. We were here when she arrived. Uh, that we could look after that. Where was the Holy Spirit in your life? First of all, it's not kind of when I was living worship, I had to walk my phone by myself, so I don't know how <laughs> Yes. 
conversation that has been experienced there, and weather events around the world that are making changes to how people live. And you think of countries like India and other hot countries where they need air conditioners because the temperature has risen so much, and yet the air conditioning changes the environment as well and, and hurts the environment. And we pray that you would continue to guide people, the researchers that are doing the work to find air conditioning that doesn't cause harm to, to our planet. We pray for wisdom and for will for governments to help embrace these kinds of technologies. God, we're we're in a world where there is war, violence, injustice, and abuse in, in our communities and across our country and around the world. We pray that people make changes of heart, that they might seek ways to come together that would bring healing and hope. We especially pray for, for peace in Ukraine and Israel and Gaza. And uh, we think of countries um, in Africa and Syria and other countries that continue to feel the devastations of violence and violence in the past. God, we pray in our first cycle for the people of Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay. We uh, think God about all those people who have been negatively impacted by um, our understandings of the world particularly our Western understandings of the world. And we pray that more people would um, embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion. We pray that our Black First Nations, Métis, South Asian, LGBTQ2SI, plus siblings, and anyone who experiences discrimination for any reason might uh, be held and cared for and respected where they are. We pray for those who are struggling with physical and mental illness. We ask for healing and hope. We pray for your strength and patience for caregivers. We pray for people who are struggling with relationships that they would find loving paths for. We ask for companionship for the lonely and refuge for the homeless. We pray for your church, wherever people gather to worship. May we follow your spirit and share your love with one another. We pray for the family and friends of Georgina Ferguson as they mourn her death. We lift up to you Beth, Beth, Bill, Tommy, Sherman, Don, Deborah, Doug in Virginia, Evelyn, Grace, Harry, Heather, Joan, Kathy, Ken, Linda, Mabel, Mary, Mary, Mike, Paul, Ron. Ryan, Sebastian, Sandy, Sarah, Tammy, Thane, Wendy, Werner, and Victoria. We pray for our partners in Mission Island Outreach, the Canadian Food Grants Bank, East Wellington Community Services, Mission and Service, and the World Women's Support Program, for Chalmers Community Center, Rodesley Mission, and Hope House, for Trinity United in Hollywood, Eden Mills, and Rockwood Presbyterian Churches, and for the Women's Families Regional. God, hear our prayers, spoken and unspoken, answering you. We pray this with the words of Jesus Christ, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from you, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please join in singing, um, Will You Come and Follow Me, number 567. Um,
we have been cared for and guided by the Spirit, and we are invited to take that care and love we receive and share it with them. Go now in the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, this day and our lives. Amen. Welcome back home. Your music goes beautiful as usual. <laughs> 